Okay, so this is an explanation of the practical we did for Unit 2. Um, as you know, according to biosemiotics, there are three parts to every sign, every sign relation, not just two parts like the word tree and the idea of a tree. According to biosemiotics, there is a sign vehicle, a response, and an object or an objective. In this practical, you're going to learn how to identify those three parts. Semiosis, what is it? Well, it's adaptation. It's learning to respond to signs. And by signs, I mean stand-ins, not the thing itself. That's what a sign is. It's something that stands in for something else. So semiosis is learning to respond to signs in the environment in a way that is beneficial, self-reinforcing, or habit-forming. The three parts of a sign reinforce each other. The triad is really a circular process, as you'll see. Okay, so let's um, look at this sign triad together. Okay, here we have a mosquito that is attracted to CO2 that's being exhaled by this person. And the goal, the object, is blood. But is that the true object, the final object that the mosquito is after? Well, the mosquito wants to eat or lay her eggs or whatever so that she can survive. She doesn't want to, but she's, she's compelled to do that. She needs blood to function and to reproduce. So the sign here to the mosquito is CO2. The CO2 stands in for blood, but not just blood. It's what blood does for the mosquito. And the response is the mosquito flying toward the CO2. So sign vehicle, CO2. The response is flying toward the CO2. And the blood is not the final object or objective. The final objective is to survive and reproduce. Okay, this is an example of classical conditioning. Pavlov's dog. A dog was set up in an um, experimental setting to test how much saliva was being generated in his mouth. And when he was presented with food, he salivated naturally, um, an involuntary reaction a reaction that is um, that he is part of his evolutionary um, history. In this experiment, Pavlov rang a bell at the same time that the food was presented. And after a while, the dog came to associate the bell with getting food so that when you ring the bell, the dog salivates even if you don't give him food. Now in this instance, the sign is the bell. The response is salivating, and the object or objective is to prepare the mouth to digest the food, which presumably is something that the dog needs for better digestion and to make use of its nutrients. In this experiment, Pavlov's amoeba. An amoeba was subjected to a blast of cold, dry air at three-minute intervals. And it had an involuntary reaction, which was to contract. Um, this contraction probably helped it survive um, the conditions of cold, dry air. The amoeba has developed a habit. Every three minutes, it's subjected to a blast of cold, dry air. And it has a response, an involuntary contraction. And that um, is good for it. It's beneficial. It helps it survive. So it, it learns to do that. Every three minutes, here comes that blast of cold, dry air. But the scientists found that when they stopped giving it the cold, dry air, at a three-minute interval, it contracted anyway. So what is the sign that this amoeba is responding to? It apparently is detecting a three-minute interval, which it has now come to associate with a blast of cold, dry air. 
and it's responding to that three minute interval as if the cold dry air really did happen. So this is a clear indication of a very simple organism learning a sign in an environment. Now this doesn't result in anything beneficial for the amoeba to contract under these conditions. It's a mistake that the amoeba makes and uh, which is interesting because when a um, a simple organism like this makes a mistake it's most obvious that it's responding to something that it has come to associate with something else that it's responding to a sign of something that's not there in this example we have the monument that is Columbus who it was said, once upon a time, discovered the Americas. Um, now people feel differently about him since his journals have been discovered and he wrote about how he cut off the hands of the native peoples that he found and came in contact with when they didn't bring him the gold or whatever it was that he was after. So now, in this day and age, the modern person there to the left of the monument now may think of him as murderer when he sees um, Columbus's statue. Someone a hundred years ago would automatically think of him as hero. If this is a triadic sign relation, the sign vehicle would be the statue. The response would be the thought, either murderer or hero. What's the objective? What's the object? The object or the objective is always some kind of self-reinforcing effect. Now, neither of these people benefit from thinking one way or the other. But thoughts tend to be self-reinforcing. Every time you have a thought, the probability that that thought will occur again is more likely. Neurons that fire together wire together. Okay, now in this example, a caterpillar, right over here, eats a corn plant. The caterpillar has some sort of enzyme in its mouth um, that triggers the plant to give off volatile chemicals that float through the air. And these chemicals attract a wasp who, over its evolutionary time, has learned to be attracted to those chemicals. The wasp lays eggs inside the caterpillar and the wasp larvae eat the caterpillar from the inside out. Now what is the sign relation? There's multiple sign relations going on here. So for the corn plant, the enzyme that the caterpillar produces is a sign of a threat and damage to its leaves. Its response is to emit volatile chemicals. And its objective is to attract a wasp that's going to kill the caterpillar that's attacking the plant. And you can imagine that this is a circular sign relation because um, the response emitting the volatile chemicals causes the removal of the attacker. Now on the other hand we have the wasp which has learned to associate the volatile chemicals with what it needs a place to lay its eggs. So here the sign vehicle is the chemicals. The response is flying toward the caterpillar and the object is to locate a food source for its offspring so that it can survive and reproduce. In this example, we have an experiment where um, slime mold finds food in the center of this maze. So it learns how to go through the maze to pick up the oatmeal, which is its favorite food. So it's detecting some 
molecules in the environment that are signs of the food that it needs. If we put a salt ring around the food, this deters the slime mold because salt is an irritant to slime mold. It won't go through that barrier. But if we saturate the slime mold with salt, something strange happens. It learns to cross the salt barrier to get the food. So this is actually an example of unlearning. Previously, the salt was a sign of an irritant, and it respond, its response was to stay away from it. Once it was so saturated with salt, it no longer reacted to the salt ring as a gradient, as something different in its environment, and it crossed the barrier in order to get the food. This is an example that I like to use a lot of a signal pathway. Like any, any one of your um, biological processes often depends upon several different um, transformations of chemicals. One chemical is transformed into another, into another, into another, before some useful product is finally produced by that very long and uh, wonky kind of process. This guy pulls a string which pops this ball up and it rolls down and it drops here and that triggers this mouse trap to go off and that hits these balls. It startles this bird and that smashes the toothpaste which squirts out toothpaste and it lands on his toothbrush. So this is a very elaborate machine for loading a toothbrush with toothpaste. And um, so we can compare it to a neuron firing. A neuron goes through a very complicated, a ridiculously complicated signal pathway in order to fire. So this has many different signs and many different responses in it. In any kind of complicated machine, each step in this process is a means to an end. And the final end is getting the toothpaste on the toothbrush. And a means to the end is like a sign of the end. Okay, so let's look at the next example. Um, together we have looked at previous examples and we've together decided what is the sign vehicle, what is the response, and what is the object or objective. For this one, since this is a makeup practical for people who miss this exercise, I'm not going to label the different parts of the sign for this one, and I'm going to leave it up to you to do that. So um, I'll do a couple of them this way. Here we have a decaying log, and it's giving off an odor. Here we have a bear who eats grubs, and he's hungry. Grubs tend to live in decaying logs. So you'll want to tell me what the sign vehicle is, what the response is, and what the objective is. In this example, it turns out that the bear doesn't actually find any grubs. Okay, now on this one, we have a tick, a little tiny insect there, and he's been waiting on some grasses. And he's just hanging out there waiting, and he detects ammonia in the air. And ammonia is a component in um, animal sweat. And as soon as he detects that ammonia, this triggers an involuntary response. His legs open up, which causes him to fall off of his blade of grass. And um, with some luck for him, he lands on an animal, a little mouse passing by. Um, unlucky for the mouse, lucky for the tick. Okay, here, what is the sign vehicle? What is the response? And what is the objective? And um, this one's fairly clear cut. The issue with this one is the fact that the response is involuntary. 
and this has come up a couple of times. Um, I've mentioned this, that this is an involuntary reaction. So I, if you choose this one to analyze the triadic sign structure, um, I'd like you to think about that. Okay, now this one is very tricky. This is a case of a butterfly species that um, when it's developing in the chrysalis, when it's exposed to a shorter day, a shorter photo period, or a longer photo period, it develops a different looking wing pattern. If the chrysalis is exposed to more light, it triggers the genes for producing a hormone. It's a precursor to um, a pathway that develops a dark pigment. So, in this example, the sign vehicle is what? What is the response and what is the objective? Here the tricky part is what is the objective? What is the object? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, people who suffer from PTSD um, may be war veterans. And for example, this man is having a a traumatic response to the sound of an explosion outside, like a car backfiring. And he immediately feels like he's back in that dangerous situation with the sound of bombs exploding all around him. What is the sign vehicle? What is the response? And what is the objective or the object? And the um, question with this one is, is the difficulty in understanding what the object or objective is. You might compare this to the other sign relation we've already looked at, the one with the people interpreting the monument. Okay, now this is a graphic of a, a kind of a cartoon graphic of a cell with a receptor protruding from the cell membrane, um, the big blob in red. And in the top graphic, you see that there's a signal molecule, that little triangle. And that receptor has evolved um, through evolution to fit with that specific type of signal molecule. And when the receptor binds with that molecule, the molecule, the signal molecule is just floating around in the extracellular fluid. When it binds with the receptor, it sets off a chain reaction of um, different chemical transformations that eventually produce some useful response for the cell. That's why the cell has that machinery that it has in order to connect with that sig signal molecule because it needs it. Now in the um, lower graphic we see that there is a strange molecule that has entered the extracellular fluid. By chance this foreign, strange, weird, never-before-seen molecule happens to connect with the receptor. Um, but maybe the fit isn't quite exact. The shape of the protein is just a little bit different, good enough to connect, but not quite enough to set off the, the normal response that the receptor would have. I'm making this up, but, but there are similar types of uh, categories of responses like this in, bio, in biology. So it sets off, the strange molecule sets off some transformations in relay molecules that happen to trigger, that trigger a different kind of response that happens to be good for the cell in a different way. Now, a lot, I'll point out that a lot of uh, medical research for new uh, medicines work in this way. They try to mimic or copy a known signal molecule in order to interact with the cellular receptors and get them to do a different thing. Um, or maybe they have um, some sort of signal molecule that interacts with a, a virus or some other um, unwanted microorganism or biological structure in the body. Okay, here, uh, this is a heat-seeking missile going after an aircraft. What is the sign vehicle? 
what is the response, and what is the overall objective of this machine. And you can look at this from the point of view of the aircraft pilot, perhaps, or the person launching the missile. And I don't know if anybody wants to take on this example to try to figure out what the sign vehicle response and objective is. Um, this is pretty complicated, and I'm just putting it out there to introduce this concept to you. An index. Um, there are three types of signs. In addition to there being three, three parts to each sign, there are three different types of sign. One is an icon that is a sign due to some sort of similarity, like that receptor and the signal molecule. Another type of sign is a symbol, like the bell in Pavlov's dog experiment. That's a sign just by some sort of conventional relationship, and it's completely arbitrary um, uh, with respect to the object. The kind of sign that we're looking at in this example is an index due to some actual physical connection to something that it is a sign of. A clear example of this is a, a weather vane. The, the weather vane rooster is pointing directly, is pointing out the direction of wind flow. I have a weather vane like that on my barn. Also, we have um, a picture of geese flying in a V formation. Their wings are sitting right upon eddies that are created by the bird in front of them. So when you look at a V like that, you're actually seeing um, the result of, you know, something that is invisible to you, the, the air flows, the eddies and the air flows. So the geese are an index of the eddies in the air. And then this other example here is a picture of a heart and the various valves in the arteries, the valves open and close mechanically as blood flows through them. It is a mechanical reaction to the blood flowing through. It does serve a purpose though, because when it closes, it keeps the blood from back flowing. Um, so the, the valve is kind of like the weather vane. So your assignment, if you weren't here, if you weren't in class for this presentation and you weren't able to work with your classmates on um, figuring out what the three parts of the sign are for one of these particular examples, I want you to do that for me. Um, you can make a video recording of it explaining it to me or you can write it down and email it to me or send it to me through Telegram, however you want to do it. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody knows how to identify the three parts to a sign. You can pick a complicated one and you can try that, or you could pick an easier one and try that. It makes no difference. It doesn't matter if you don't get everything right, because some of these things are really hard to figure out, and I'm not so sure sometimes uh, how to label each part. Okay, so let's summarize some of the issues here that I want everybody to think about and rethink about if you're watching this after having attended the class already. Maybe some of you are reviewing this lesson. So when you're looking at these sign examples of sign relations, to what extent are the responses to signs voluntary? And what this requires you to do is really think about what the word voluntary means. What is the probability of that response to that sign. In some instances, it seems clear that it's unavoidable. In other instances that we've looked at here, it seems like maybe the agent could have that kind of response and in other situations might not have that kind of response. And what does that mean for the sign when we are looking at something and saying it's a sign of something? If it always triggers the same response, is that a sign? If it sometimes triggers that response, is it a sign? And I don't think there's a clear answer to that. What if the biological tool that detects the sign fails? I mean, it's, it's evolved, it's designed to do its job, but it doesn't do it for some reason. Is it still a sign if there's no response to that sign?
what if the biological tool responds, but it responds mistakenly? It fails, but a different sign is detected instead. What are some of the machine-like behaviors that we looked at in this exercise? Are some of the biological behaviors machine-like? What are some of the interpretive behaviors that we looked at today? Are some of those interpretive behaviors actions of machines? Which kinds of behaviors are easier or harder to describe with equations? Which are harder to predict? Which are harder to categorize according to some sort of rule? Can they all be described? quantitatively? Or do some of them require a qualitative explanation or description? What is more intelligent? Fallible responses to things as signs? Like when an organism or a machine messes up, is that intelligent? Or is precise, infallible identification of things more intelligent? And for that one, you might want to think about the little cartoon graphic of the molecular processes. Okay, now that you can all identify the three parts of a sign relation, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the object. Um, sometimes I've been calling it an object, and sometimes I've been calling it an objective. I'm going to show to you a video of a talk that I gave in Moscow last summer about this issue. Signs seem to stand for physical objects, um, real things in the environment sometimes. When we are pursuing signs of other things, we assume that there is an other thing that the sign is leading us to, but we may be mistaken. Nevertheless, the sign is still a sign, even if the object doesn't exist in reality. What is biosemiotics with Victoria Alexander? Let's talk about cellular signaling. Why do biologists refer to something that is excreted by one cell and taken up by another as a signal? Why do they call it a message? Doesn't this invest the cell with intentionality that it doesn't really have? Why don't biologists just refer to the process of chemical exchange as simply a chemical reaction? A molecule passed between cells is called a signal if it sets off a response that is ultimately good for both cells and or the body they're part of. So a signal has a function for survival and maintenance. And the cells have been evolved by natural selection to process signals. A chemical in the body that does not have this kind of effect is not a signal. Signals relay information about the state of affairs in one cell to another so that the receiving cell can respond appropriately, usually by producing additional chemical signals to send to other parts within that cell or to send to other cells. Cells, after all, have to work together in a coordinated way, and this is more or less the essence of a living system. Biosemiotics is concerned with the larger ramifications of these facts. There is no clear boundary between life that is primitive and life that, like us, can use language and communicate really complex abstract ideas. The signaling process gets more and more complex with organisms of greater complexity, but signaling is signaling. If you want to know how intelligence emerges, or if you want to understand the fundamentals of language, you should look at cell signaling, because that process shows you the basics of communication and intelligence, what it is and how it works. So that brings us to the question, what is a sign? Now we enter the field of semiotics. Some people may be familiar with Ferdinand Saussure and his definition of the sign as having a signifier, for example, the word tree, and a signified, the idea of a tree. We're not going to use that model. We are going to use a three-part model based on the American semiotician C.S. Peirce. Now, Peirce used some really ugly terms that most people find confusing, namely representament, interpretant and object. I don't want to lose my audience, so I will call these the sign vehicle, the response, and the object. Object is in objective. 
Mainly, Peirce worked with human semiosis. Biosemiosis requires some rethinking. According to a human-centered semiosis, for example, in this three-part sign model, a molehill, this little mound of dirt here, is the sign vehicle. It has a physical connection to a mole, so it's the sign of a mole. The mole itself, as the sign object, partly determines the response. So when you see a mound of dirt, it triggers the interpretation of it as a sign of a mole. Unlike with Caesarian semiosis, Persian semiosis is supposedly grounded in reality. But there's a problem with this human-centered semiosis. This is a field by my house. The mounds of dirt function just like the word mole in my mind. Every time I drive by this field, I think mole, subconsciously, automatically, which just keeps reconfirming that reading, neurons that fire together, wire together. But guess what? It turns out these are ant hills. The object of this sign cannot be a mole. There is no mole. And yet for 10 years, every time I drove past this field, that sign of the mound of dirt triggered the response mole. These are actual mole hills. Clearly, we cannot say the mole is the object of the sign of true mole hills either. If you talk about the objects of signs as if they are abstract things, generalizations, they are ideas in the mind of the interpreter. And this is not helpful because it still leaves the question of explaining what ideas actually are. This understanding of Peirce's triadic sign relation does not work, and this becomes most apparent when you are trying to understand cellular signaling. So what actually caused the anthill to trigger the thought mole in my mind? What constrained that response? Well, the fact that it had caused it before, and before that, and before that. The anthill kept triggering mole in my mind because it was a self-reinforcing habit. Neurons that fire together wire together and nothing had happened to break that habit. Sign readings that are wrong are still sign readings. In fact, dysfunctional sign readings show better how signs actually work and come to be. Here is a neuron. This is a model of a dopamine signaling pathway which helps create intelligent semiotic behavior. Cells don't have representations that are not self-reinforcing signal pathways. Neither do we. We don't have thought bubbles anywhere in our brains. We have self-reinforcing signal pathways, which are our mental habits. If you don't imagine the neuronal processes underlying ideas as self-reinforcing pathways that recreate the conditions that allow them to continue, then you aren't doing it right. Here's how I want you to understand what a sign is. Think of each step in this pathway as a sign for or means to an end of the ultimate reinforcing effect. If we define biosemiosis in this way, it has real explanatory power. It explains why people believe things that aren't true. It explains why we can have allergic reactions to neutral things. It explains how life first emerged. It explains how meaningless things can acquire new meanings. It explains how creativity is possible. It explains why AI fails compared to biological intelligence when it comes to adapting to context. The molehill is a sign of a mole if I respond to it that way and there is a self-reinforcing effect on that response. Seeing an actual mole would certainly reinforce it, but habits can be and tend to be self-reinforcing. That's why they're habits. Natural selection works fairly well controlling cellular signaling, not as well in the mental world unless there is direct contact with the physical world. I should have gotten out of my car and, and had a closer look at the supposed molehill. For my text-oriented sign readers, here is a four-slide definition. I define sign action as the process wherein an individual self, like a cell or an organism, encounters a sign vehicle and responds to it, transduces it, interprets it, in such a way that there is a reinforcing effect on that response toward that sign. Such sign readings lead to semiotic habits. A self can misread a sign vehicle due to a coincidental physical similarity to a familiar sign vehicle. We call this an icon. Or a self can misread a sign vehicle due to an association with an object, a reinforcing effect, that is coincidentally nearby, and we call this an index. It points to something.
These misreadings can lead to novel adaptive behavior if a new reinforcing effect results. The semiotic tendencies that constrain readings and misreadings constitute selfhood, and therefore automative and adaptive behaviors are self-created. Taken together, the two aspects of sign reading, habits and changes of habit, Directionality and originality produce the intentionality of an individual self. Groups of selves or cells experiencing more or less the same conditions send and receive signals such that waves of coordinated activity emerge, and through the same mechanisms, coordinated wave behavior can switch to a different regime. This illustration shows that similar signaling molecules and relay molecules might lead to different cellular responses with the same semiotic infrastructure that has evolved by means of natural selection. Living systems have agency to the extent that there is flexibility in all information processing capabilities, immune responses, sensing external and internal conditions, regulating internal operations. Semiosis is virtually identical to intentionality. We need to remember that the nodes in any communication network aren't passive pass-through points. They each have the potential to interpret or to misinterpret information. This potential is a measurement of how adaptable and how creative the individual may be. Living systems sometimes have reliable, predictable behavior that is almost machine-like, especially when they are carrying out vital functions. And they can also be adaptive when the environment changes, especially when they are carrying out vital functions. As Don Favreau has shown in the introduction to his book, Essential Readings in Biosemiotics, signs have not always been associated exclusively with the human mind, words, symbols, or culture. A more general understanding of a sign as a mechanism in all biological systemic processes had been advanced by Aristotle and some medieval philosophers. Unfortunately, at the very beginning of the modern era, Descartes, who didn't know about this work, convinced the majority of the Western world that the road to inquiry necessarily forked into mind and matter. With the introduction of information concepts into biology, terms such as signal and code suddenly appeared like strange specters in chemistry and physics. Biosemioticians believe that the sign concept spontaneously crossed the Cartesian barrier between mind and matter as a natural consequence of the self-correcting nature of scientific practice. It was needed. Okay, so that video segues nicely into our next discussion of Don Favreau's book, Essential Readings in Biosemiotics, which is our first reading assignment for this course. So we've just been looking at sign action in biological systems where there's no brain involved. Now, maybe you can see it seems obvious to you that, sure, there are sign relations that occur in nature even where there is no thought going on. Favreau points out that Aristotle argued similar things, and the medieval scholastic philosophers also had a concept of, of the sign. Sign action and semiotic relations became associated purely with thought. Favreau notes that, in particular, René Descartes is responsible for completely severing the subjective internal experience and the objective world. He makes the case that the science of semiotics provides a naturalistic bridge between subject and object, between objective and subjective experiences of the world, between quantitative and qualitative understandings of phenomenon. We also read Jesper Hoffmeyer's Code Duality chapter from his book, Biosemiotics, which was also included in Favreau's Essential Readings in Biosemiotics. Hoffmeyer explains that there are two basic kinds of codes, a digital code and an analog code. Digital codes are, of course, symbolic representations that are completely arbitrary, like the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And, of course, letters are arbitrary representations for certain sounds. Analog codes are not like those symbolic codes. They are 
like icons and indexes. And I'll just read from Hoffmeyer. The alternative to a digital code is an analog code, and this kind of code is based on the principle of analogy. In an old watch, for instance, the pointers circle the watch dial in a kind of analogy of the perceived rotation of the sun around the earth. One might also call a glove an analog coding of the hand, and in a certain sense, one might even see the wings of a bird as an analog codification of the aerodynamic properties of air currents. Note, however, that the coding principle in digital codes is necessarily arbitrary. That the word horse in English refers to a big grazing mammal cannot be recovered from the form of the letters. Since the genetic code is based on a sequence of discrete signs that are grouped together in a sequence of triplets, the genetic code is a clear case of digital coding. Hoffmeyer goes on to argue the digital genetic code requires interpretation during development. Similarly to the way that digital language of letters and words requires interpretation during the course of reading. We will continue with these themes throughout the course. Remember that you have a PDF of essential readings in biosemiotics in, in the Google Drive. You have all the course materials there, either there or on the syllabus. They're linked on the syllabus. So many of the issues that we brought up today are going to be reoccurring in every unit. So, it, so if there's anything that you didn't understand here, take the time and go back to it.